In just seven days' time, we'll find out who the next Labour leader is here in Britain. Senior new Labour figures such as Tony Blair have urged Labour members not to support frontrunner Jeremy Corbyn, alleging he has Alice in Wonderland politics. One of the architects of new Labour was Blair's Home and Education Secretary, Charles Clark. He's the co-editor of two new books, British Labour Leaders and British Conservative Leaders. He joins me now. Charles, welcome back to Going Underground. Two books you've uh, co-edited. We're going to concentrate <laughs> on the Labour one for now, as our uh, viewers will uh, imagine as, as to the reasons. You say at the beginning of the Labour one, the characteristics of Labour leaders, of any leaders, over-egged by Thomas Carlyle as regards their importance. So why edit books on leaders of political parties? I think it goes two ways. Uh, one school of theorist theoreticians, for example, Karl Marx, argued it was all about class and individuals played no role. Others argue that it's all about individuals. And I think the balance has gone a bit too much in the Karl Marx direction, I don't mean in an economic sense, that thinking leaders really don't matter. And the argument of the book is if you go back and look at a number of choices of how leaders behaved, what they did, how well they performed, that does change the politics of the country in a whole series of different ways. And uh, I think the chapters we've got in the book, the biographies by uh, academic specialists, uh, really demonstrate that very well. Your chapter focuses on electability. Do you think it, it echoes uh, Blair's concerns about a Corbyn victory, that electability is the important thing. And you also talk about the need for cunning. Is it electability or cunning that's required of the next Both. Labour leader? Both. I mean, electability is absolutely central. There have been some people in this campaign, the current Labour leadership campaign, who suggest electability doesn't really matter. But that can only be said by people who aren't that affected by what governments do. And in fact, there are millions of people at all kinds of level who are deeply affected by what governments do. And I think the idea that electability doesn't matter is um, a luxury for those who really have no big concerns in their lives. Cunning is necessary because to be elected is not just a simple thing. You have to develop a strategy, you have to develop a pathway to decide what is your strategy for being elected. You've got to work out where you stand relative to the overall ideas and thinking of people in the country, at least in a democracy. That has to be a central part of where you are. And you have to work out how you present yourself in that way. And that's the difference between democratic politics and a darts club or an academic seminar. Uh, that's all fine, but actually getting the power to make a difference is what counts if you're in politics. But isn't, I mean, we have three leaders up there on, on that uh, screen. People might not even recognize uh, two, of them, two of them. I don't know which two of them, but Clement Attlee is known for conscience above all. Isn't that the most important? And certainly the most, when it comes to Labour's most successful He is most la la Labour's uh, most successful leader, but I think he demonstrated also a great deal of cunning, particularly when he was Deputy Prime Minister during the war to Winston Churchill. He basically took command of the home scene, what was going on on housing, education, transport and so on. And that put Labour in a very strong position when the election actually came in 1945. Indeed, one of the most surprising things in these books is Churchill's great failure uh, to win 1945 when everybody thought, well, he ought to, and he certainly thought that himself. But at least Cunning uh, avoided that. Uh, MacDonald was a different case. Ramsay MacDonald. Ramsay MacDonald. He was the first ever Labour Prime Minister, a fantastic person. He would certainly had a conscience. He was a conscientious objector in the well, First World War. In a coalition and who was subsequently hated and by generations hate, of people in the Labour Party. By you, no doubt, when yeah, you were in the ab party. Absolutely hated. He was uh, regarded as the great betrayer because he didn't have the cunning to find his way through the situation in which he found himself. Or did he lose his conscience? I very much doubt that. I very much doubt that. I mean, it's a very easy choice to say that people who don't succeed things don't care. And I don't think that's right. I don't think that's true even of Ramsay MacDonald. I mean, the cynical view that says he was so interested in power and, uh, you know, affluence and his uh, wealthy um, female friends and all of this kind of thing, and he forgot where he came from. I've never believed that. You say that uh, Blair succeeded in gaining the economic confidence of the electorate. Don't you think anyone in 1997, as a leader of the Labour Party, could do that, given the disasters of the Conservative administration that preceded it? The disasters certainly made it easier, but I don't think anybody could have done. I mean, even those people who think that John Smith, had he not died, uh, would have won that election, and that's something I'm slightly doubtful about, actually. All concede that he would have done less well than Tony Blair did uh, in that election. 
Um, so I don't think it's, uh, there's any inevitability about it at all. You support Liz Kendall, I understand. Uh, I voted for her, yes. I voted you first for her, second for Yvette Cooper, and third for Andy Burnham. And uh, she says that she wants to sign up maybe to George Osborne's fiscal plans. Do you see uh, her matching those leadership qualities that you talk about in the book? I think she's not as strong as she needs to be, and I think that's why she's not winning this election. She became the continuity... As strong a Tory. <laughs> well, if you take the, the Conservative point you made, of course, that's exactly what Gordon Brown did in 1994 uh, and Tony Blair's leader uh, when they said that they would keep the spending plans of the Conservatives even if Labour won the election. Why? To give confidence to the electorate that there wouldn't be any experiments with what was going on, that people could be fairly confident that we would continue operating in that way. And I think why Liz said that was because she recognises that need to be able to um, give confidence that, uh, that uh, Labour will run the economy in a successful way. You have called Jeremy Corbyn a nutter. Um, why did you call him that? I mean, you also I, said he was cynically using the Iraq war for his campaign. Well, I, there were two different comments. I didn't actually call him a nutter directly. What I said was that we're, this was an election of continuity versus change. And Yvette uh, Cooper and Andy Burnham are coming across as the continuity candidates, brackets, uh, Brown and Miliband, and Liz Kendall is coming across as the con continuity candidate Blair, and so Corbyn is the change candidate, and everybody wants the change candidate, and that's why he's doing so well. I said it was a shame that he, um, that Liz Kendall hadn't come across as the change candidate, which is what actually I think she is, um, and that I thought it was more correct to describe uh, Jeremy Corbyn as the Ben slash Nutter candidate. Is that where that phrase actually arose? Continuity, Tony, Tony Ben. Mm, yeah. So um, a chart um, on Conservative Home at the moment says that Cameron uh, reinforces uh, the, the truth that the Conservatives only won a quarter of the number of uh, votes in, as regards the electorate. Surely it is about winning over, since your, your chapter is about winning over, all those people who don't vote at all. That's the critical mass to uh, yeah, if Labour you can, if, you, if you can do it, it's a fantastic trick to pull off. But people shouldn't dismiss David Cameron too, 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 too lightly. As the table in the Conservative book here shows, uh, David Cameron has been the most successful Tory leader in terms of winning seats since 1900. Um, the most likely action of those people who don't vote is they'll continue not to vote. Now, if you can pull off the trick, and that's obviously what Jeremy Corbyn believes he can, to get these people to decide to vote, whereas pre otherwise they wouldn't have, then that is an electorally very important trick. But it's quite difficult to achieve. So if Jeremy Corbyn, say, won the Labour leadership contest, could people like Liz Kendall, who wants to adopt Osborne's fiscal levels of spending, they could all branch off, perhaps ally with the Tories, leaving Labour to be the, the, the Attlee-style uh, policies? I, I really don't think that will happen. Uh, the, Labour had that in the 80s with uh, uh, the STP formation, and I don't think anybody in Labour wants to go off and set up any other parties. This is Labour's party, and we have to make sure we can really put forward the kind of workable policies that he was famous for. And just very briefly, there was uh, some talk about Corbyn's position on the monarchy. You, you were in the news recently about the letters from Prince Charles that you wanted to issue. Do you think uh, the Prince has been uh, entering into politics too much when you were Education Secretary? Not really. I, it's just a, a part of process. He's entitled to write the letters and he's entitled to get responses. Um, I, didn't, um, I didn't particularly listen to what he had to say and I don't think one should. Uh, I think one should be courteous about it, and that's where to go. I'm not an abolition of the monarchy man. Uh, I'm not sure if Jeremy really is either, but uh, maybe he is. And who do you think will win? I just don't know. I think it's quite wrong to say that the election's all completely clear and all sorted out. I don't think that's the case. I think that uh, uh, it could be uh, any one of them at this stage. Um, all the you don't talk, believe the polls? Uh, well, there's not really many polls. There's a couple of ones very early on. And we don't know who was polled and who was actually voting. Um, we just don't know. And there's been, rather like the general election, a kind of whizzing around on the polls on one side and the media on the other, developing an expected outcome, which in fact, in the case of the general election, turned out not to be true at all. And do I think that could be happening now? Well, I do. But I just, so I, I've got no intelligence to bring. I can't say anything sensible about who I think is going to win. But I certainly don't think it's clear that necessarily that Jeremy Corbyn will win, which is what everybody seems to be assuming. Charles Clark, thank you. Thank you very much.